This is an intro. I don't need an intro. I don't need an intro. It's just a big show. Big show. Big show. YouTube, what is up? I'm your homeboy, homeboy Josh, back at you. And today we're going to have a bit of a live Q&A on the most recent build we put together for the Coil Wars build-off competition, the uh, staple uh, the staple Tiger Helix coil. <laughs> so uh, I thought we had so much fun with this, doing it on the reactor coil. I thought we'd, we'd do it again, maybe even make it a regular thing. We'll see how it goes, you know? Um, We'll get we'll just dive right into it that what you just saw a moment ago was the new intro you'll be seeing at the beginning of all my videos in 2017 decided to change it up a little bit change things around sort of a new fresh face on everything relaunch the channel for 2017 a little bit so should be a good time let's get rolling so getting prepped getting started with any kind of build. Most builds, you're going to start out just by straightening out some wire. And that's what we're doing right here. We're straightening out uh, a bit of 28 gauge off the spool. I'm um, taking it about three times off the spool here is generally how I like to measure my wire. And I'm using 28 gauge nichrome here is what it is. You can use any kind of wire you want really for this build. You can use cantball, you can use nichrome, you can use stainless steel. In fact, this build is really a mix of nichrome, stainless steel, canthal, um, and that's it really. Just those three different sorts of uh, th sorts of wires there. And straightening out wire, I mean, a lot of this is going to be a review for a lot of you guys that have been building for a while. But what's cool about the staple Tiger Helix coil is that there's a lot of different techniques and a lot of different things that go into a build like this uh, from creating a Clapton coil, to decoring that Clapton, making an alien coil, to twisting wires together, to helixing wires. There's a lot that goes into it that's going to be very rich for someone that's getting into building. So I thought it was a good one to have a discussion over. Looks like we might already have some, some questions coming in. So let's uh, pull up the chat. There we go. Questions about ramp up of wire. Um, you know, I've never really messed with stainless steel until now, really. I, I played with stainless steel a little bit when I was making some staggered fused Claptons uh, months and months and months ago, a long while ago. And what I noticed about stainless steel wire, what I, what I noticed about it the most was that it was basically, um, it didn't pop as much as other kinds of wire. It didn't really, you know, it didn't spit is what I noticed about it, which I thought was pretty cool. Something nice about stainless steel wire is that it really doesn't spit. Pretty awesome. Uh, Nichrome, I noticed, definitely does have a faster ramp up than, say, Canthal or other kinds of wires out there, but not so much, uh, not necessarily stainless steel. Um, questions about taking the springiness out of wire. Yeah, you can certainly torch wire. That's absolutely an option. I prefer not to torch wire only because torching the wire can take out a lot of the, uh, basically it, it weakens the wire a bit if you ask me. And also you ruin, the, you miss the opportunity of colorizing the wire later on. So this is basically making a Clapton coil here. Okay. And Clapton and wire the thing that helps me the most when clapping wire is basically to keep it at 90 degree angles. You notice here in this, what's going on here, if you can look and if you can see the wire that's coming off the spool, it's being held at a 90 degree angle, forming complete right triangles between the core wires and the wire that's going off the spool onto that core wire. And that is what I find the easiest way to make a Clapton coil. Just because if you're holding the wire this way, it's going to back up on itself. And if you're holding the wire too far this way, it's going to spool onto that core wire too quickly. It's going to create more of a gap. Now, you don't want to put too much pressure on a core wire like this. You want to keep it as loose as you possibly can. 
let that wire just kind of move between your fingers and it just move off the spool and onto the core wire is what I find the is going to help you the most when making one of these guys. Um, and you want to make sure that it's all coming together clean. When I'm spooling this wire off the spool and onto that core wire, what I'm looking at is the sort of the, the shadow on the core wire, the way that that is coming together, the way that's going onto the core wire. I'm looking at the density of those wires together. And I am basically looking for it not to, because if it's if it's too if it's too light in color, I can see that you know it's it's too spaced out. If it's too if it's becomes darker very suddenly, I can see that it is sort of backing up on itself, and I can find ways to to correct that. Right here in a moment, I'm going to have a a, a point where it's actually. I'm actually going to be angling the wire to the the spool too far in front of the wire, and it's going to end up actually spacing it out too far. What I'm going to end up doing is pulling that out right there. See that? There's a little spot where that just kind of skipped. And now I'm going to go ahead and correct that by pulling that wire off the core wire and then spooling it back onto that core wire quickly. And the reason I do it so quickly is because it's if you go too slow here. If you stop and then start up too slow, it's going to create gaps. And you just want to basically just spin it back on there really quick. That's the best way I've found to correct an error when I'm making a plastic. A uh, question about uh, how long I've been vaping. When was I, uh, where is it? How long was I vaping? How long did I smoke before? Well, I started vaping. Uh, back about three years ago, just over three years ago now, and I smoked for about, I smoked since I was fifth, 15 years old, and I smoked until just three years ago, so, what is that, I'm 31 now, so, I can't do math today, I smoked for about 13 years, is what I did. Yeah. So, and uh, I haven't really picked up a cigarette since. I've got a video where I talk about my whole vaping story. If you know you haven't had a chance to check that out, it's a good one. Oh, the video is laggy. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I don't know what I can do. Let me see here. See if I can change anything on the fly. Let me see if I can. Let me see here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I cannot change anything on the fly. That stinks. Okay. Well, we'll do what we can. Hopefully it doesn't come out too bad. We'll see. Uh, anyway, where were we? Um, there's another question a little bit higher up about coloring wire. We're going to get to that in a little while. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Anyway, where were we? So, decoring the wire. Decoring the wire, as long as you make the Clapton good and clean, it's going to slide right off that core wire nice and easy. And it's not going to give you any trouble sliding it off as long as you did it clean. Now, for me, what I like to do is I put my... I put my... Um, my vise right there in the corner of my table. Right over about here is where I put my vise. And then I lock that Clapton into that vise, just the end of it. And from there, it's a matter of stretching that wire across the room for me. Uh, with me, my room is kind of like the perfect length, I've noticed, for how far to stretch that wire once I've spooled it, spool, creating the original Clapton onto a, three, a length of wire about three times off the spool doesn't really matter too much about you know what kind of wire that that was spooled over what kind of wire was the core as long as I bring it all the way across the room seems to do the trick generally so this is kind of a close-up shot of what your wire will look like when you are stretching that wire out across the room 
uh, what that wire is going to stretch out to. Because what I've noticed with a lot of people, a lot of the problems that they have with making an alien coil is how far that they should stretch that wire, how far they should bring that out from, you know, where, what that point of tension is. And to be honest, what I've found is that the best way is not to go by sight for me. The best way for me is to go by feel. When I can feel that wire starting to kick, when I feel the point where it's starting to, you know, give just a little bit, when it's not willing to stretch freely, that's where I need to stop. And that seems to do the trick for me. And what I've always liked to do is to spool it back onto an empty spool because I like to create my alien coil off of a spool. It makes it a little bit easier for me personally. Now, a lot of people don't like to do that or, you know, there are reasons not to. Um, we'll say that. There are reasons not to do this. And one of them would be, say, you want to get to the point where you can make interlocking aliens. Well, I suppose you could re-spool it, but it's going to be more difficult with, you know, without doing it just a single... Um, single alien uh, fuse over your core wires. Um, doing it with something like interlocking aliens, doing it something with like stitched aliens, it can make it a little bit more difficult, for example. Force cord with three. Hmm. Any suggestions for aliens for going from the first core to the three? Um, well, that's that's what this is really. Uh, what it is is basically, it's an alien coil is built on a three to one ratio. Okay, an alien coil you start out with one core, and then it's built on a three to one ratio, so three of the same size core. Now, with this coil, what we're doing is we're actually going to be alienating, alien fusing around a bit of ribbon wire. So it's going to be a little bit different. Now, the way that we do that is, you know, it's math. Um, there's plenty of wire charts out there that you can go to and you can see, you know, how, how wide different gauges of wire are. 28 gauge wire, for example, I don't have them, I don't have the chart pulled up. I meant to do that for this video, but I forgot. I have a, the chart in the uh, hybrid coil video, it's same chart pretty much. And and that chart gives you the wire gauges, the sizes in millimeters of each of the wire gauges. And by calculating, you know, how thick three strands of wire are, three strands of 28 gauge, that's what lines up with, you know, 0.8 ribbon wire, which is what we're using here. This is a 0.8 Temco ribbon wire is what I use in this build here. It's Canthal ribbon wire. And uh, I love this stuff because it comes off the spool super, super clean. Um, the thicker the wire gauge you go with, uh, with ribbon wire, I've noticed, the cleaner it comes off the spool. Problem is, you know, you can't stack ribbon like this vertically and create a staple out of it. It's just too thick. But it's great for something like this, like a tiger. It comes in perfectly handy for that. Okay, good. I'm glad I was able to answer your question then. Okay. <laughs> Tips for fuse clapton twisted wire. Twisting fuse claptons? Um, in general, twisting wire. What I will do, and you'll... Well, no, we're going to alien right now. We're going to get to twisting wire in a minute. But I'll tell you, I mean, in general, twisting wire, what I will do is I'm twisting the same wires together. You know, I'm twisting, you know, two strands of you know, 30 gauge, or I'm twisting two strands of 24 gauge, for example, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, sometimes it becomes a matter of twisting different kinds of wires together. For example, with this, we're going to be twisting two strands, a uh, strand of alien wire together with a strand of uh, straight wire. With that, you just kind of got to hold both strands together. But when you're twisting the same wires together, say you're twisting fused clapton coils, what I do is I make a bow and I sort of, you know, basically loop that wire around and I use a screwdriver and I hold the screwdriver in my hand and I basically just pull the wire like this and fire the drill with the other hand. See, I'm still demonstrating like this, like I'm righty and lefty, but you know, like, like I mentioned in this video, Dwayne got me 
you know, to the point where I was willing to try the other hand. And he's been telling me that for months. I need to try building with the other hand. He was right. He was right. So the alien, alienating wire. Another thing that gets people about the alien coil is the angle. The angle is incredibly important when you're creating an alien coil. It's not like creating a Clapton or a fused Clapton where you're working at right angles. You're actually, you actually want to build it at a bit more of an angle, something like this maybe, you know, um, whatever, whatever that is. I don't know. Uh, do I have a protractor? I have a protractor. I'm wondering what the angle is myself. I have it handy. Oh, well, maybe another time. But you want to lead the wire, essentially. You want to basically push the wire off in front of where you're clapping toward. Angle it a bit. That is the, that's the way to do it to ensure that the wire is not going to back up on itself. That's the way to do it to ensure that it's going to alien cleanly together. Um, and if you mess up, you know, really, you just have to keep going. This, where I'm stopping and starting, stopping and starting, that's honestly just for the video. Uh, that's so I can get different shots and different angles. And ultimately, this wire strand was pretty much useless. I ended up getting rid of it, and I made a whole other one. Um, because stopping and starting and stopping and starting, you know, really the only reason you want to do that is if you're trying to get close-up macro shots of the uh, wire being aliened in, uh, on video. Otherwise... You know, otherwise it's just, you know, inconvenient. Uh, it ends up in having little gaps all over the place. I mean, this wire, I think I have it somewhere, but it's pretty much unusable. Yeah, I do. There we go. Yeah. This wire is pretty much junk. Um, junk. Gaps here, twists here. Gap there, gap there. Yeah, it's a mess. Uh, ultimately, the strand that I used had about one gap in it. That was about it. And what I did there, um, it was kind of funny because I, I'd made it the day before. I, I kind of messed around with this coil a little bit the day before. And I was talking with Dwayne and talking about how, you know, the... Yeah, like this kind of gap, something like that was what I ended up with in the final version. It wasn't that bad, but something like that. And when something like that happens, you just got to keep going. Now, this is something that I definitely kept out of the video. This is another strand that kind of failed along the way. And this is kind of a cautionary tale that I wanted to have in this video for you. Because as much as I love working with an empty spool and spooling up the uh, the decord Clapton wire to make it easier for me to f alien fuse off of. The thing is, it can come back to bite you in the ass <laughs> if you don't secure the wire properly to the spool. If you don't secure it properly to the spool, what's going to happen is that wire is going to sort of fall off the back end of the spool and end up getting tangled just like this. And the thing about alien wire the thing about decord Clapton wire that's been stretched is that it is going to get incredibly, incredibly tangled. Uh, this is why I choose to spool it on up to an empty, uh, an empty spool in the first place to avoid this happening, to avoid wire just getting caught on itself. And decord Clapton wire that's been stretched wants to do that. It's, it's designed to get caught up on something, and it's no fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> so basically, after, you know, 15 minutes of me screwing around with this, this wire, I just kind of threw my hands up in the air, and I moved on with the stuff. I ended up making another wire after that, just because it was such a mess, such a, such a complete and utter mess. Um, it, it, in general, wire like this, um, spooling it up can save you this kind of trouble. So I recommend it. But, you know, if you do, remember to secure your wire, wire pretty well. <laughs> I 
I think I left this segment going a little bit too low. That's okay. It was also kind of funny because the day before I'd made this wire and I'd actually gotten through, you know, a complete two and a half foot strand from beginning to end um, going at full blast with my drill, my 800 RPM drill, which really is not very fast at all. Uh, but it's the first time I ever went, you know, from the beginning of an alien to the end of an alien at full speed. And I had this perfect strand all made. But, you know, I didn't have the camera running. So I remember laugh, having a laugh about it with Dwayne the other day and telling him it's funny how the moment you turn on the drill, everything kind of goes to shit. <laughs> the moment you turn on your camera, everything kind of goes to shit. The moment you're on video, nothing works out anymore. But anyway, uh, at this point, I've got my, my wire made. And what I'm doing here is I'm getting ready to get these wires seated on into the chuck of the drill. And we're going to twist them all together. Um, the way I generally would do that in a case like this, back to twisting wire, is you know you can leave the wire on the spool if you know one of those wires is you know one of those wires you need to make, like uh, like an alien wire or a fused Clapton wire, or something like that. The Rashomon. RDA, I have not tried it. I haven't seen it in person. Um, I can't think of it in my head. I can't picture it right now. It's kind of like a, a big U, isn't it? Something like that. It's kind of cool looking, but I haven't played with it. Anyway, so getting this wire all situated, I'll anchor both the wires into the chuck of the drill, and I'll angle the wires into separate bits of separate parts of the chuck. Uh, different teeth of the chuck. It makes it a little bit easier to do this and keep them separate and keep them twisting properly. Now, twisting the wire, especially like this, where I'm using two separate strands instead of you know a single strand that's been looped over, and I'm you know using a screwdriver to anchor those ends in while I twist. I'll definitely go slow. You start out twisting wire slowly very very slowly at first and then speeding up gradually and the reason for that is that you can kind of make sure you're putting enough tension on the wire that it's not going to bunch up and that it's not going to um, crimp up on you and it's still doing that a little bit here you can see close to the end of the uh, the uh, and there there it broke out of the chuck and when that happens you just seat it back into the chuck and go again but you can see where it's kind of bunching a little bit toward where the um, the uh, pliers are. Now, avoiding that is it's just about control and speed. And it's a lot easier to do when you're doing it with the same wire. For example, if you're doing it with, if I was just doing this with that alien wire, or if I was just doing it with that 28 gauge, and I brought it out the drill in one long strand and then looped it around and took the screwdriver to it and fired up the drill like that, that would prevent it from twisting and from bunching on itself as well. But with two different strands of wire, it's a little bit different. But in general, bunching like that, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to produce, you know, you're gonna have plenty of, of usable wire here. Now in terms of the helix wrap, this is like a very standard single wire helix. This is going to basically just allow you to is someone a moderator? Someone destroy Cody Pickett, please. Thank you. You're awesome. Anyway, um, <laughs> thanks, Lemmy. The uh, yeah, helix and wire. It's just a matter of matching up the angle of your wire to the gaps in your in your in your twist. That's all it is, really. And then powering the drill, moving it along that way. Now, the important thing is that you remember to charge your drill. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, because I did not charge my drill here. And that's what you see here is me screwing around with this wire, trying to hand wrap the last little bit of it. Um, and I've gotten to the point now where I'm just 
focusing the camera <laughs> and then I'm uh, taking the time to hand wrap a little bit here and a little bit there to keep it going. This is the dual strand of the uh, the dual strand. Of, hey, Yeti, how you doing, man? The dual strand of the 40 gauge that's going over the alien wrap right here. And it's segmenting that alien wire into two pour in two points, which is kind of like a two for the price of one, if you ask me. So I've got like this dual strand of 40 gauge that's feeding more juice to the wire. It's going to produce an even yummier bait, probably. So what I'm doing there is I'm hand wrapping where I need to and then firing the last bit of power out of the drill whenever I can. I'm almost at the end of the strand here. It's just a matter of getting through it. So it's about making do with what you have, I guess, in a case like this. If you run out of power, you know, you can wait and come back. I could have started over, I guess. But, you know, I'm almost there. I'm almost at the end of it. I've got enough wire to finish. You know, why waste it? Why start over? So just a few wraps here and there to keep it going. Some people will do a wire like this completely by hand. You can twist wire by hand. You know, you can basically loop the wire around, say, a doorknob, and then take a, take a screwdriver and just twist it all by hand. You can do all this by hand. And then the fuse is just about feeding the wire into those grooves that are made up by the twist. Now, when I was done, I did give it a good little twist at the end just to tighten everything up and uh, had that wire shot that I took with the, uh, the Nikon. Now, I had enough wire for three strands. I ended up putting it in this guy. This is the... Uh, what is this thing? The Triad, the Triad Genesis. And I've had this thing for a long, long, long time. Uh, as Modus is probably out for my blood. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I will review it. I am going to review it now that I've finally got it built. Thing is, when I first got this thing, um, I was going to build it right away. I wanted to put the corrugated build that I did for the... Uh, the last episode of Coil War Season 1 where we announced the Corrugated Challenge, that Ivy Wire build that Farrell had originally done, that's what I wanted to put in here. I wanted to put three of them. And the thing about this deck is that it's a velocity-style deck, okay? It's a velocity-style deck, so it's easy enough to build on. But the thing is, the thing is that it's an angled velocity deck. And that coil, you really need just a straight velocity deck to anchor it on in there. Otherwise, it's just going to be, you know, it's just not going to work. You know, the angle makes that coil too difficult to seat into a deck like this. But for a coil like this, you know, the just a straight up helix, it goes in no problem. It's perfect. Um, getting the wire all wrapped. Uh, getting the wire all wrapped, you can see it's it's a matter of twisting the wire too, because this wire is going to be particularly springy. A uh, twisted wire, a helix wire, it's going to have a lot of springiness to it. So you want to take the time to make sure that the wire is good and tight. If you tighten it up the right way, it'll actually even it ohms out at a, a 0.14. 0.14 when it's three coils like this. Um, you want to make sure you take the time to make it good and tight because if you tighten it the right way, all the different segments of the wire, the different helixes, the twists in the wire will kind of all line up. Um, I didn't take as much time to do that with this build as I could have. If I had tightened it around a smaller bit, for example, like this is a three millimeter bit that I'm wrapping this around. If I decided to then go ahead and twist it around a smaller bit, like two millimeters or two and a half millimeters, just to make it a bit tighter, I could have gotten them a bit more clean. Now you notice I am using my Hacko pliers. Uh, everything else is the Coil Master kit. The Hacko pliers, I love those pliers. I can't say the same for the Coil Master kit pliers. Everything else out of the Coilmaster kit is pretty straight. I, I'll say that I like the uh, the Sifu B tab a bit better than the Coilmaster, you know, 521 Mini. It's just a better build quality. But yeah, you know, those are the three coils all set up. But the the wire cutters in the Coilmaster kit, eh, I didn't like them too much. They kind of fell apart on me a little bit. Like the handles were coming off. It's kind of a mess. 
but I'll review it in the next yeah, week or two, probably. Week or so. I don't know. I'm trying to get that review out. It's mostly print, but I'll talk about it some more then. Um, what box are you running on this stream? This is the uh, Cartel DNA 200 is what this is. Um, yeah, it's only like, uh, I want to say only 300 of these were ever made. So I feel fortunate to have scored one. I've got a review up as well. It's a funny one. I will say what's really nice about this deck is how the how it's designed for vertical coils. It's perfect for vertical coils on this deck. And when you're setting it up, you can basically just anchor, you know, the, the bit that you wrapped it around right inside the wicking holes while you're situating your coil. It's kind of like building on the marquee almost. If you remember the marquee, you know, it came with these bits that were specially designed for that RDA. And they had these little cutaways inside the deck. That was one of my favorite RDAs for a while. I did like two, three videos on the marquee RDA when I was first, you know, first starting out on YouTube. And uh, I haven't used the marquee in a long time, but that's one thing I always loved about it was the way that you built it. The way that it made it so easy to build vertical coils and it came with these specialized bits just for it. I thought it was awesome. And this kind of behaves in much the same way. Um, the thing that annoys me about this particular RDA, I should wait for the review for this, but we'll get into it now, I guess. Why not? What annoys me about the triads, and I have both the RDA and I have the Genesis. What annoys me is that the parts aren't fucking interchangeable. Okay? The deck on the Genesis is way better than the deck on the RDA. It's got wider post holes. The post holes in the Genesis, if you look at them, they're super wide. They're like um, they're like the sort of post holes that you have in the Tsunami. They're awesome, right? But the post holes on the RDA, they're just teeny and round. But the air holes on the RDA are freaking huge. And the air holes on the Jenny are just teeny tiny by comparison. Meanwhile, the drip tips are not interchangeable. You can't use the drip tip from the Genesis on the RDA and vice versa. So none of the parts are interchangeable and it's like completely ass backwards. Like the deck that's in the RDA should go with the with the RTA if you ask me. And the airflow that's on the the airflow that's on the RDA is fine for the RDA, but I still wish it was interchangeable. For the Jenny. It's just weird. It's just odd. Um, the way that they designed them. Personally, I don't see why they didn't make them completely interchangeable. Uh, use the same deck, use the same drip tip, use the same airflow, uh, top caps. I think that would have been smart, but that's just me. Anyway, so the device is built at this point, and we're going to get into really quick uh, about getting color out of your devices, out of your builds, really. Um, this is just straight wire, and this is three different kinds of wire here, essentially. This is Canthal ribbon here. This is nichrome alien fuse. This is um, nichrome twist of the wire. This is uh, stainless steel helix. Okay, there's a lot going on here, so you can get some very rich color out of this. And uh, Canthal underneath that alien coil. So give it a good wash is what it is. You want to give it a really nice wash in, with some soap. And then it's just a matter of pulsing. Now, what I'm pulsing at here is 50 watts using the Sifu B-Tab. I got to say, I love using the Sifu B-Tab for the builds because it really gives me that extra control that the other tabs don't. I can control that wattage. And the reason I'm going at 50 watts here, normally with a, a build, I'd probably start at something like 60. No, that's 60, I'm sorry. Normally I'd start at something like 20 or 30 watts, something like that, and go slow from there, bringing out color. But with this, it's a triple coil. So if I was starting out at 20 or 30, it would be just incredibly, incredibly slow going. 
It's just not enough power to get that going and rolling. And with that, I was able to get this shot. And what this shot is, is it's actually 15 shots that are focus stacked together. And if you look, these are the shots here. I'm gonna get rid of my video capture, I'm gone. Okay, great. So if you look, I've got all the photos here. I don't know how well you're gonna, this is gonna show up on live stream. I don't know how well I'm showing up on live stream, but if you look, each one of these individual shots has different focal depths. Different things are in focus in each shot. And then I went and I grabbed this uh, software. It's kind of a, a uh, it's kind of a, um, it was a free trial is what it was. I'm probably gonna end up buying the program, but it automatically just stitches all those photos together and creates that photo out of those 15 different shots. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah, really awesome stuff. I, I really enjoyed that program. Um, and that was using my new light box. My brother-in-law got me this for uh, Christmas. This is a light box, man. Do you see the size of this thing? Here are the stipulations with me and my gear, okay? My gear needs to be compact. I don't know how many of you guys saw the green screen behind the scenes video, but if you notice, the green screen that I use is homemade. I made that green screen by hand using fucking presentation paper is what it is because I have limited space to work um, and I need stuff that folds up and is compact and can be put away easily. There are two LEDs up over here. That's it. That's all that lights this thing. And it folds up into that little portfolio looking thing. It is awesome. So if you're trying to get a little bit more serious on, you know, with your photos, um, trying to get more serious with your coil shots, that kind of thing, you might want to look into something like a light box something that can be broken down if that's something that would you know if, if that's something that's important to you someone shut up simon pasonyi whatever his name is destroy him anyway yeah so it's kind of like a fun little foldable little light box there it allows me to just sort of put it away whenever i'm not using it uh, i plan on using that quite a bit in 2017 it's gonna be a lot of fun um, so I'm going to get some more shots of uh, my coils, which I was really good about for a while. I was good about posting to Instagram, and then I just kind of got distracted, and I've been, you know, focusing a lot on YouTube and all that without uh, getting back into Instagram. But anyway, wicking. Uh, wicking is is very straightforward with something like this. Uh, it's a matter of just push freaking, you know, push the cotton down through the coil into those wicking holes and down into the tank. Now, this tank is teeny, okay? This tank... It's a two milliliter tank. And obviously, you know, it's for TPD regulations and keeping in line with that, it still annoys the fuck out of me. Uh, I can vape this down to empty in 15 minutes. But, you know, it is what it is. What was my first mod? Um, my first mod was, I mean, aside from ego batteries and whatnot, that kind of thing, uh, my first mod was the, uh, the IPV3. The IPv3. It was not just any IPv3. It was a Thin Man. It was a special edition from uh, Vapor DNA. What is my favorite cotton? This cotton is. What is this cotton? I can't remember what cotton I'm using here. See, cotton's never been that important to me. I've never cared that much about cotton. Cotton is cotton. I mean, when I started vaping, I was using Muji. Muji's great. Uh, it's cheap. It's whatever. Um, I'll tell you that the best cotton that I've ever used, I don't have any more. I, I, maybe, maybe I have a few uh, few pieces left over was the, uh, the Kendo Vape cotton. And not the new stuff, the gold edition. I don't like that as much, but the original Kendo Vape cotton. That stuff is the shit. I love the original Kendo Vape cotton. I don't think I ever tried Native Wicks. It's on my list. But, you know, I've never been picky about cotton. Cotton is cotton for the most part. But the kendo, I love kendo, especially in the aeronaut. Especially, you can see I'm looking at the aeronaut right now. I'm never far from that thing. I've got a review coming up where we're going to talk about the, uh, the um, 
help me. The drip box 60 watt from Kanger. I've been using this combo, the Aeronaut with this device since just before Christmas. I can't put it down. I've never used a squonker before. This is life changing. It's like the best shit ever. Squonking with the Aeronaut, it's like magic. I fucking love it. This thing on the other hand, what the fuck is this thing, man? It looks like the bionic fucking bait. It looks like it looks like something out of fucking Star Trek. It's freaking weird. Anyway. So everything's all wicked, everything's beautiful. The thing is that with this device and with RTAs in general, Genesis style RTAs, that's too much wick right there. Um I find it best to wick about uh in a regular RTA, in a regular Jenny, that would be fine. That would work, okay? But in this one, with it only being a two milliliter tank, it's too much cotton. I ended up pulling it up a little bit and clipping it off a little bit more, made it work a little bit better for me. Saw some questions I missed. What was that? Uh, the insulator, no, I haven't had any problems with the insulator, none. Um, what time is it really? Uh, if, over here, it's 1240. Um, we're almost done, actually. Um, I prepared about 40 minutes worth of video uh, for the, someone destroy Pody Cricket. Go away. <laughs> anyway, uh, where was I? This is kind of a cool shot. It's something I didn't notice before. Uh, the wire, the stainless steel wire is gone gold. I wish I'd kind of gotten a shot out of it because I didn't, and I wish I had taken a few photos of that. Maybe I will later, if it's still that same color, is it? It might be, it might be. Might get a couple more shots of that later. It's kind of a cool color, the blues, the gold. I like that. Uh, wicking, you know, back to wicking. Generally, I cut it just above the coil, and, you know, saturating the coil here, you know, gets it started, is the thing. Giving it a good, Getting the coil, the, the wick, good and wet, giving a few pulses with the coil will get that uh, cotton starting to pull moisture in. It'll get it the, the the it'll get the cotton doing its job. There are certain kinds of cotton out there that you need to pulse to start it get going to make it that cotton start to uh, feed juice to it. If you don't heat up the cotton, it's not going to work. And in general. You know, something like this, a Genesis style RTA, what I'll do sometimes is I'll actually turn it upside down, hit the fire button a little bit, just to feed more juice to the coils. And that'll oftentimes do the trick, especially if I've overwicked, for example. If I've overwicked something a little bit, then doing that will get the juice flowing to that cotton a little bit more. Say I'm on the go and I didn't bring any cotton with me to rewick, or I didn't bring any scissors or tools with me to fix anything. That'll sort of save the day. This is the coolest thing about this device and then the most annoying thing about this device, if you ask me, is the way you fill it. There's like this little hole in the top of the, uh, the deck. That's pretty cool. And there's little holes, little juice holes that feed down into like the different sections of that cotton because that cotton, when it's inside the tank it kind of segments it into like three separate sections for the juice and where the juice can feed to the cotton and when you put juice into here it kind of goes through these holes and goes into those three separate sections it's really neat but it's also kind of annoying because when you're done you tap this thing on there and then every time you want to fill it which is often because it's only a two milliliter tank you need to take that off and then push juice back into it. What is my favorite RDA of 2016? Um, if anyone's been watching my channel, you know what it is. You know it will always be the Aeronaut. Uh, in this case, the Aeronaut V2. I love that thing. Anyway, um, best flavor build I've done. Oh, we're done with the uh, we're done with the video. Okay, great. Let's go back to make sure I'm hitting the right button. Yay, I did it. All right, great. Uh, most flavorful vapes I've ever done. Um, this one's pretty flavorful. Is it the most flavorful? No. Um, 
probably one of the Staggertons that I've put together. Staggertons are really yummy vape, you know. Um, anything with a staple is very, very tasty. The thing about staples is you kind of have to get used to them, though. They're really, really hot. Um, and you can really only do them single coil, if you ask me, you know. Uh, alien coils are incredibly flavorful. Um, you can combine the two and make, a um, you know, a fralian, you know, a, a frapel. <laughs> a frame staple alien, for example, that's an incredibly flavorful vape. It's also ohms out incredibly low. You want to do that single coil, but it's a it's a good one, absolutely. Well. You know, I hope this kind of stuff was, was helpful to you. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll definitely be doing, I, I want to do more of these in the future, uh, preferably ones that I'm not lagging on. I hope that the audio the, hasn't been lagging too much throughout this and that the, the video came out okay. I was trying to get at a higher quality than I did last time, so eh, maybe it didn't work out so well. Maybe we'll go down, down a step in quality next time. Uh, the Super Soaker build that I put together was incredibly favorable, too. Uh, there's a Super Soaker Staple Tiger tutorial that's out there. That one's very, very yummy. Absolutely. Have I seen the pin dad from Bomber Tech? I have not. Uh, do I think the RX300 is overkill? You know, you asked me that. If someone was to ask me that, not you asked me that. If someone was to ask me if the RX300 was overkill maybe a month ago or so, I would have said... I would have said no. I would have said yes, probably. Shout. Hi, Alex. What's up? Um, I would have said that that was overkill, maybe a month or two ago. Thing is, well, maybe not maybe a month or two. I don't know. I don't know how long. Would I have said that that was overkill? Put it this way. A year ago, I would have said that 200 watts was overkill. Now, my vaping style is completely different than... You're welcome, buddy. You had a great build there. Um, my vaping style is completely different than how it was a year ago, than how it was two years ago. You know, when I started vaping, I started vaping on, you know, egos. And I started vaping on, you know, cigalikes, that kind of thing. And that was great at the time. Uh, and then I moved on to sub tanks and I was vaping at 20, 30 watts, you know. And then, you know, I started building RDAs. But... You know, I looked at people that did, you know, exotic wire builds. And I thought to myself, what's the point? Why bother? You know, and then, you know, I, I got inspired by people on Instagram and I decided to see what would happen if I twisted a couple pieces of wire together. And there's actually a video. Um, there's actually a video. I have it on video. The first time I ever took a hit, uh, a vape off of, you know, an exotic build. Twisted wire was the first thing I ever took a to had for an exotic build and it's the dark horse mini uh review and in that review i took my first vape off of a twisted build on camera and you can see my face is just melted off <laughs> it's like i'm floored it was the single greatest vape that i'd had in the course of me vaping up until then and i was just blown away and from there you know, I had to try new things. I had to try different kinds of wire. I had to try alien coils. I had to try Clapton coils. I had to learn how to do these things because I, I needed, I, I wanted to, you know. And as I started building those sorts of builds, a lot of them, you know, I needed more power for them. Like I was saying with a staple coil, for example. Staple coils ohm out incredibly, incredibly, incredibly low. You know, um, you know, a single staple coil, you know, not, not staple coil necessarily, the frame staple coil or a stagger tin, for example, uh, a single one can ohm out at, you know, one ohm or below one ohm, not one ohm, point one ohm is what I'm trying to say. It, you can super sub ohm with a single coil that way. So with that, yes, I can see the point of a 300 watt device. Absolutely. This 200 watt device, I mean, I can pump coils up to 200 watts sometimes and I'm like, okay, I can take more. Some coils need that kind of power to get them going, uh, to get them ramped up and, and working properly, you know, um, to get them heated to the point where they, they, 
they do what they should do. Um, but 200 watts, it can actually still be limiting at times. Now, I like regulated devices for that reason, because I can have complete control over the power of the vape, and I can have complete control over, you know, how much heat I'm getting, and I can do it safely. And I like that a lot. Um, I don't mess with mech mods too much because, you know, just mainly because Waffles doesn't like me to. That's the life. But, you know, also because, you know, um, regulated devices are, are great for just uh, safety, for one thing. I don't have to worry about what I've built as much with, with a regulated device. It's just like a, an extra little safety net for me. And 300 watts would allow me to have even more of that threshold. Um, it would allow me more leeway with what I can, I can build and what would work in my device. So I can see the point of it, honestly. I can see going higher. There are people that vape at, you know, 1,500 watts. I mean, they're, I mean, I was about to say they're crazy, but they're not. That's the thing. I mean, it's all about personal preference, you know. I was satisfied for the longest time vaping at 20, 30 watts. My wife still vapes at 20, 30 watts. Me, I like that power. I feel like I'm rambling, but it's it was a good question. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've tried the Vision MK sub tank. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, one of the devices that we first started out on were the, the Vtox tanks by Vision. Uh, we love those things for the longest time. Um, another thing about regulated devices, and I should keep this for the review, but I'll, I'll just mention it really quick. Kanger, Kanger sent me this device, the Drip EZ. It's terrible, but whatever. Um, and EV Cigarettes sent me the K-Box 60 Watt. I'm going to do a review where I talk about the two of these. And they behave completely differently. But one thing I love about the K-Box, I'll tell you that right now, is and I've, I've loved this about the original K-Box too. You know, the K-Box gets a lot of hate, but I love the K-Box. And one of the reasons is that the K-Box regulates power optimally. Um, from the beginning of that battery cycle to the end of that battery cycle, it's the same vape the whole way through. And I love that. I love that it's the same vape the whole way through. I can vape at, this is 160 watts. Uh, right now I have it at 150, but yeah, I've been pretty much vaping this device at 160 watts from the beginning of the battery cycle to the end of the battery cycle, detecting no change in power. Not all devices do that. A lot of devices, you'll find that they will sort of peter out. You'll see a change in the power that they're providing toward the end of their battery cycle, for example, like when they hit 3.6 volts in the battery. Well, this device pretty much stops you from vaping at 3.6 volts, so it's perfect the whole way through. The latest mini mod trend, I'm sick of it, to be honest with you. I really am. I'm so sick of the mini mods. Uh, it's just one after another. Uh, it's just like a new bandwagon. You know, I, I mean... So I guess some people like that kind of thing, but to be honest with you, I don't find it very comfortable in my hand. But I mean, to each his own. You know, if you like mini mods, then it's great. You know, if you have small hands, then it's great. Uh, me, I like big mods. I like beefy mods, personally. You know, this is a big mod. Uh, this is about as big as a Hammond box. Uh, I mean, I like a big mod, but that's me. You know, it's not for everyone. Some people like the teeny tiny things that you can fit in, you know, your pocket or your purse. I don't like them. Yeah, I hate the mini mods personally. They just kind of, they make my hand cramp up trying to use them, you know, because you're kind of like holding them in this weird way. They last all of two hours. I just don't like them. Um, I use them for like secondary devices now and again. Like if I'm going to walk the dog or if I'm, you know, if I want a spare mod that I have in case one of mine dies, I'll use it, sure, but I'm not a fan. I have not seen the DNA 250 Mad Hatter. And uh, Tamara's out. Later, Tamara. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, I like big mods, Kelly. You know, they're, they're just... I just like the way they feel in the hand, you know? 
big beefy mods that have weight to them you know that's the kind of device that i like um i think i, I made the joke when i was messing with the daedalus and i said that i wish i wish i had a mod this size and it's true i wish i had a mod that size my ideal device in my mind would be a dna right now uh with the technology right now would probably be a dna 250 uh because i don't think they've made a dna uh, 300 yet um, I don't have a Boss 3000. Um, my ideal device would probably be a, uh, a DNA 250 and a, a 3S2P. Um, you know, a 3S2P LiPo, which would mean it was two 3S LiPos in parallel. That would be, like, my ideal device. And these batteries are big. You know, they don't make mods with these batteries. Um, I'd probably have to have one specially made, or I'd have to make it myself. But I want one. I definitely, definitely want one. And it would be a big mod. It would be a very big mod. Um, it would be a good handful of a device. Anyway, guys. Uh, it's about one. Um, I wasn't planning on staying on more than an hour. Um... I will, where's the cat shirt? No cat shirt today. We'll have a cat shirt another time. Um, but it was fun, guys. I had a good time, and we'll definitely do this again. I hope that the, the replay looks okay. Um, I heard some comments in there about, you know, the, uh, you know, the, there being some lag. So I'll see what it looks like. Maybe we'll take the quality down a peg on the next one if we do this again. But uh, let me... Thanks for having my back out there. Thanks, everyone, for the great questions. Um, Happy New Year once again, and I'll see you guys very, very soon. Until uh, next time, I'm your homeboy, homeboy Josh, Maple Vapors.